Chai with Manjula presents NRI, A Closer Look, a special series that focuses on some of the key issues that affect Indo-Americans and NRIs and takes a close look at solutions and prevention as well. They came with dreams, worked hard and struggled, and they succeeded in making a life for themselves in a foreign land and culture far, far away from home. And now that they are in their golden years, they have yet another big mountain to climb. My concerns about growing old in the United States uh, revolve around, number one, having a good social environment for all of us, and uh, not to become burden on our children uh, as we uh, have health issues. The things that really worry me being in U.S. Um, and getting old here is the health issues where there are kids who are very good kids but whether they will be there for us to take care of us the way I feel we have taken care of our parents in India. Being all alone and lonely, that really worries me a big time. I think the challenges are really going to come when uh, uh, out of the two of us, uh, one of us is left alone. Uh, at that time, uh, you really need some kind of support system. Culturally, we feel we want to be close uh, to our children. And that remains a challenge. We are here to stay. Our children are here, our friends are here. We should get people from India on a visa so that they can come and help. This would be similar to the au pair system that is for child care. It will be great to have a community kind of a setting where lots of friends are around maybe walking distance or in one great neighborhood. Unfortunately in the U.S. there's no old age home that are, that's catered to Indians. I think it's about time somebody does something about that. Life is difficult and surely enough we won't be staying with our kids. As we get older we really don't know uh, what our future holds. I really don't know how, what we're going to do when you get older. Love and affection, which we get in India, you're never going to find it here. Welcome to Jai with Manjula. As we all know, the flow of students from India to the U.S. began in the 60s. And then measurable immigration followed in the coming decades. Now, Indo-Americans constitute about 1% of the U.S. population. And what we just saw was some of these pioneers sharing their concerns about the life ahead, which has become a common topic of discussion in social gatherings these days. Well, very few of us foresaw the changes in lifestyle, the evolution of the next generation, and most importantly, the issues related to old age. So for many, the reality is here with all its challenges. NRI A Closer Look presented by Chai with Manjula and sponsored by the Tech Museum of Innovation San Jose California a unique hands-on technology and science museum for people of all ages and backgrounds which inspires innovations for the benefit of humanity and Development Alternatives Group a non-profit organization in India that brings together traditional knowledge and modern science for sustainable development at the community national and global level my guest today is Dr. Kailash Joshi, who came to the U.S. 50 years ago, had a distinguished career with IBM Corporation, and is known in Silicon Valley for co-founding Thai and American India Foundation, or AIF, as well as for his mentoring and charitable activities. A few years ago, his wife passed away at age 61 after a brief illness. Kailash has reflected on several things, including realistic planning for old age and death. And based on his own experience and observations, he has come up with five broad areas that everyone should consciously address in their midlife to avoid grief and anguish later. Kailash, welcome. Thank you. Well, during the last few years, you went through a difficult time after your wife, Hem Joshi, passed away after a brief illness. But over time, you have managed to rebuild your life. And I'm happy to learn that you have found someone and you are engaged to her, a lovely lady, Sushila. So congratulations, first of all. Thank you. Uh, yes, it has been a very difficult time for me. But now I see some light at the end of the tunnel and mm -hmm. life ahead with Sushila. I'm very happy for that. 
you have learned a lot about this kind of a transition in life. And you have put together some very good advice for us, which you have categorized in five areas. And I would like you to share that advice with us today. And what I see is on number one on your list is health and disability. So tell us about that. Uh, health and disability, I think, is a very important aspect, no matter at what age group you are in, right mm -hmm. from the day you were born. You worry about health care, insurance, pharmacy, all the traditional things. But somewhere along the line, when you are in, approaching older age, late 50s, 60s, 70s, additional considerations come into play, as everybody knows. Right. Uh, one of them happens to be, where are you going to live when you get older? Mm -hmm. Because the requirements are going to change. Right. You're going to have to depend on services and supports outside of your home. Mm -hmm. So that becomes an issue. So assisted care living, right. nursing homes. So that becomes part of that. Yeah, and it's a very big concern. Big concern and a big consideration. And the second one is one of disability. It comes into two ways. What happens to you if you get disabled? Mm -hmm. Or what if you have to look after a disabled spouse? Mm -hmm. or someone else in the family. Mm -hmm. Those two require a lot of thinking and planning mm -hmm. and a lot of research. Right. So right. those two dimensions need to be taken into account. And it can be very expensive, so you have to Expense, uh, yeah, yeah, have provision for that. Yeah. And I think most people probably think about it, never get to doing it. Right, but my right. recommendation to people is that don't just look at the cost of health care, which insurance company, mm -hmm. which hospital, which doctor. Those are good things. But also look beyond that about where are you going to live when you approach your later years mm -hmm. and who's going to support you, what kind mm -hmm. of nursing care uh, and also uh, you know, what are the other uh, considerations right, that go right. into managing disability for example. Right. Okay, so that's some good advice about health and disabilities. And next you have relationships with friends and family. Tell us what role do they play? So again, uh, you know, all life long, you have uh, relationships with your children, okay. family members, friends. But I think something happens as you get older. Uh -huh. Different considerations come into play that need to be thought about. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I think that I recommend for people to do is really take stock of your relationship. Uh -huh. Where are you in this relationship? Because, you know, you can make a lot of assumptions. Mm -hmm. you, you need to make sure you are, you're okay. Okay. Like how close are you to your children, for example? Mm -hmm. How many close friends do you have that can really, that depend on you or that you can depend on? Right. Friends, everybody has a whole bunch. Right. So, but I think some level of determination needs to be made because uh -huh. when you do need someone, uh -huh. who do you call yeah, who? So, that, that, so that you're not disappointed with a response, for example? Right, right, right. So that is one aspect uh -huh. of assessment of your relationships. Mm -hmm. And the second one is how do you now live. You know, India, we're used to joint family living, for example. Well, that doesn't quite work. Children have their own lifestyles, their own mobility, their own requirements. Mm -hmm. So you want to, uh, by recommendation, is live closer to children, not with them. Right, if you, right. If you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the best situation. That's the be close be, to be them. Be close enough. But not with them. That's right. Are there also, wait for them to invite you. Don't uh, invite yourself too often. Okay. Don't interfere with your daughter-in-law or son-in-law, whatever you happen uh -huh. to be coming new to the family. Right. Because right. that can become a very major concern. Yeah, that Sometimes can... Sometimes it can break marriages, actually. Absolutely. So my, my advice is stay very loving and supportive and gentle, mm -hmm. but non-interfering. Okay, so uh, we'll take a short break here. Okay. When we come back, we'll carry on our conversation with Kailash Joshi. Welcome back. My guest is Kailash Joshi and we are talking about preparing for old age. Kailash, you covered health and disability and relationships with friends and family. And next on your list is preparing for death, which is not a very easy subject to talk about. So tell us, what does it involve? So yeah, Manjula, it's a taboo topic mm -hmm. and it is something that we avoid discussing as human beings right? because we believe we are immortals mm -hmm. and uh, especially uh, when you're young and energetic and life is ahead of you kind of a thing as you grow older you know it becomes I think it's wise for people to sit down if you're married for example for both the spouses to sit down mm -hmm. and discuss very openly the possible thing that can happen or that are going to happen actually right? 
and one of the, 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 the eventualities is going to be that there's going to be a first death, one spouse is going to go, mm -hmm. leaving the other one behind, and all the consequences of death right. for that person to face. Mm -hmm. Then there'll be second death, and you know, a lot of things will happen between the first two. But that, that has its own consequences, but that are not as germane. Right. Uh, because you're both gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third aspect is that there can be also simultaneous deaths, where both the yeah. spouses are killed together mm -hmm. in an airplane crash, for example. Absolutely. So I think the, the discussion needs to happen in a very serious manner mm -hmm. and in a realistic manner mm -hmm. about what are the, our views of what should be happening before, after, and so on and so forth. Okay. And I always start this topic of uh, start with a pre-death. Mm -hmm. And that is the state of coma or uh, unconsciousness one, one might go through right. in a disease situation before uh -huh. death, for example. And then life support becomes a big issue. What should be the conditions to sustain your life? Right. Or when do you don't want it anymore? If multiple. you have multiple children, you yeah. allocate all of them. Let them collectively decide. But you can also say, I don't want to be sustained beyond this point and that point. You right, can express right. your own parameters. Yeah. They have to make the final decision. Right, of course. because it's very hard for them at that time to make that decision when they are already grieving or That's hurting. Right. That's right. So it's good to give them some good guidance mm -hmm. that helps them make the decision also. So I think that's the first uh, aspect of it. Mm -hmm. What about organ donations? Yeah, organ donations is very Part important. We should register for it ahead of time. If you will. With DME, DME right. or uh, exactly. with the state. Exactly. Uh, beyond that, you now go into uh, last rites. And that those are also depending on your beliefs mm -hmm. and your own uh, desires and wishes. Uh, some people you know, want to be cremated in a certain way or somewhere or buried perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, ashes to be distributed or not distributed. Mm -hmm. Some may want ashes to be preserved. Who knows right, what right. each individual desires. Uh, yeah. India is a factor. You want to have an immersion done in India. Some people may want a cremation in India too. You yeah, know? So, so I think all those things, unless you have sit, sat down and expressed and written mm -hmm. them down, yeah. uh, how would anybody guess? Right. So you need to specify every little detail. Specify all these details. Yeah. Yeah, they're not very pleasant in some ways, uh -huh. but you are also taking the burden off of your survivors right. By, right. Doing, by, by doing that. Absolutely. Uh, how do you want to be memorialized? You know, do you want to have annual rights? Mm -hmm. uh, during the Sharad time, or do you care for maybe you want to build a temple somewhere in your right, name, right. or a school, or a scholarship? Mm -hmm. There are different ways that you would like to be memorialized, yeah. or maybe you don't want to. But again, make that known, right? For right. The, to make it easier for your mm -hmm. survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I think it would be helpful to give some guidance to the surviving spouse. Yes about who should they depend on uh -huh. if you're gone, uh -huh. uh, what should, how should they maintain a relationship with children, mm -hmm. uh, management of money, uh, management yeah. of relationships, and uh, remarriage, you know, I mean, those are all difficult things, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some very significant uh, points about yeah. planning for death, uh -huh. that people would be very well served, and their survivors even more so, by having them document. Okay, so then we move on to the next point, which is asset allocation planning. How do we do that? What's important here? Just from my own observations, I have a few pieces of advice to give that I think might be worthwhile. One is that I think it's if you have multiple uh, candidates to to uh, for your assets to be transferred to, like multiple children uh -huh. or multiple organizations, what have you. It's not a good idea to leave illiquid assets for them. Yeah. Because right. that can create contention. Uh -huh. And who is going to, going to own them? Who's going to sell it? Uh, how are we going to divide it? So simplify matters yeah. as so much as possible. Leave, do not leave assets that cannot be easily divided mm -hmm. to multiple people. Because okay. you are you are gone and you're leaving a big problem for them. Yeah. So that's my first advice. If you have buildings and big assets somewhere that are illiquid, uh -huh. cash it out, put it in a bank in some place and let them divide the money and be happy. Right. That's, right. That's, <laughs> Otherwise, there are so many fights in families. <laughs> that's right. That's number one. Uh -huh. My second advice is that take, take into account some deserving charities that you have wanted to support in your lifetime. Uh -huh. You are not able to support as much perhaps. Uh -huh. Here is your opportunity to write down uh -huh. X percent to this charity, Y percent to that charity mm -hmm. after your time. And that is tax deductible. That also gives 
your family, a lot of pride for what you did. Right, and you earned some good karma. Good karma, of course, right. always. Yeah. And I think in terms of the, that is after your time kind of a scenarios. But in your time, I think managing your assets and getting good advice is always very nice. Now, who is a good advisor? So I think that ideally, an advisor should be one who understands finance, but does not make direct money from you. Pay somebody fee <laughs> for advice, that's beautiful. That's fair and square. Okay. And I think, you know, there are so many other experts available in this field to sit down with them and maybe take multiple pieces of advice. Okay. Before you decide. Second opinion and exactly. third opinion. Exactly. Okay. And remember, at one some point, you are mentally going to be disabled, not to be able to manage all these. So you right. need to have that into account also. Okay. How do you know you go into dementia, for example, and you have all the assets? Who's going to look after them? So it's good to designate your children or some okay. custodians or whatever have you. So you should start planning ahead of time, it's maybe right. in your midlife, 50s or, 50s or 60s. late 50s or yeah. early 60s. Yeah, when you're alert mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, sane <laughs> okay. and, and all those things. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you know, if you go into the twilight zone, right. uh, then you've lost it. You know? At right. least your wishes will not be articulated yeah. properly. V yeah. Very good thought. Yeah. Okay, so Kailash, we covered health and disability, relationships with friends and family, preparing for death, asset allocation planning. And that brings me to the last point on your list, which is downsizing. What is downsizing in your mind? How do we do that and why is it so important? So I think that's a very good topic and I actually have gone through it so I can talk with a bit more confidence about mm -hmm. it. So what downsizing really means that as we uh, develop our lives and families grow and uh, grow our careers and all good things happen and hopefully you've also been able to accumulate assets mm -hmm. and uh, one after the other bigger and bigger home and right. bigger and better neighborhoods right. bigger lawns and all those stuff and a lot of more furniture mm -hmm. so you've sized up right you also have a whole circle of friends that you're going to parties every day every weekend whatever mm -hmm. have you a lot of golf you're playing maybe your business commitments are also huge maybe you're running around so mm -hmm. it's really a combination of uh, mental load that you have built upon yourself to maintain uh -huh. a home, maintain the social structure, maintain business commitments and all those things. So downsizing means you gradually bring them to a more realistic level mm -hmm. that are more fun to do okay. and easy to manage. Uh -huh. Given that you don't have the same energy and agility and mm -hmm. speed that you used to have before. Living a quality life. Quality life, unclutter. Unclutter, yeah. So you unclutter mentally, unclutter right. physically. Mm -hmm. So for example, I came from a 6,500 square feet home to about 2,000. Okay. And I gave away most of the furniture and uh, just, I said, okay, I'll start mm -hmm. over again. Right, I'm right, buying right. some new furniture now. Okay. It turns out I gave away too much. <laughs> <laughs> but then you are not supposed to miss it. What you have given away no, is that's gone. Right. Move and on. Learning, learning not to miss a big right, home right. and all that clutter. Yeah. is a very big part of downsizing too. Uh -huh. Okay, all uh, very good points. It's a very well thought out plan and so it's all about specifying everything and planning everything ahead of time and yeah. have it in writing. Researching, discussing okay. and have both the spouses very closely uh, mm -hmm. understanding what yeah. each one, each other is expressing and put it out there. Yeah, not many people do that. Very hard. Very yes. hard to yes. do that. Kailash, I thank you for your time and wish you all the best. Well, I'm glad I could share some of that and I hope it benefits the one or two people out there. No, I'm <laughs> sure it will help many. Thank you. Thank you, Kailash. So today we discussed what we could be doing to prepare for old age. But on the other hand, we do need support from our community also. What we need now is our own retirement communities. Then of course comes provision for assisted living. We know that a couple of retirement communities have already come up, but we need them all over the country. So next time, which is after two weeks, we'll talk to the founder of a senior community to learn about the model which could be replicated in other cities as well. We'll also have a retirement planning specialist to give us some important tips on planning for old age. Welcome to our special segment, Technology Benefiting Humanity. My guest today is Talence Orme, Senior Manager of Volunteers and Training at the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose, California. Talence, welcome. Thank you. 
The Tech Museum offers some wonderful programs and at a very large scale. And it's a nonprofit organization that depends a lot on volunteers. So today I would like you to tell us about the volunteer program at the Tech. Sure, we actually have over 350 volunteers wow. that uh, are with us at the Tech Museum. We're very happy to have them. Many of them are retired. Um, from their professions in the computer industry in the Silicon Valley and other places in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are in between. They're uh, um, anywhere from 25 to 45 or older okay. um, in between jobs. But while they're lo looking for a new job, they're also um, you know, volunteering at the tech for us. And then we have our high school and our college volunteers. So the high school students that volunteer at the Tech Museum, uh, what kind of incentives or initiatives do you have for them? And do you have a special summer program for them? Um, we have a little under 100 volunteers mm -hmm. that are high school. Mm -hmm. um, many of them, we have two different uh, primary high school programs. One is kind of our fall or school year program mm -hmm. where they will volunteer with us while they're in school um, and volunteer only on weekends. Because okay. obviously many of them, they can't do uh, Monday through Friday because their parents want them to focus on their studies. Right. But on the weekends, they can volunteer for us for four, four and a half hours to help in the museum. Um, the other program is our summer program, mm -hmm. where we have kids just help us from June through August. Okay. And they get a wonderful uh, variety of experience interacting with the uh, uh, guests in the museum that have maybe even come to this country for the first time. Uh -huh. So I think that's one of the joys about volunteering is that you get to meet a diverse uh, mix of people mm -hmm. that come to the museum and you learn how to interact, how to engage, how to mm -hmm. open up conversations. And this prepares high school, college, and even some of us that are in between or going to different professions, how do we interact with people? I see. And do they get hours also of community service if they volunteer? At yes, the tech? they do. We actually track their hours. They get uh -huh. hours for community service. Mm -hmm. um, we will sign off on their community service uh, uh, info flyers and information, whatever they need for their schooling. Mm -hmm. um, but they get the, I think the biggest thing that they get is the experience of interacting, mm -hmm. engaging. I mean, we also have uh, different programs where they get to uh, maybe help out for certain events. We just had the Tech Challenge mm -hmm. is one of those big events. And many of our high school volunteers that came and helped, they got to interact with uh, professionals from the Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. So that was a good opportunity for even high school students that helped us or volunteered for that event to interact and uh, mm -hmm. uh, intertwine with those who are in professional careers that they may be pursuing. Okay, so Tech Challenge is one of the programs that they like to get involved with. What other programs do they find exciting? Um, some of the other programs we have are um, where we do partnerships like with the Bay Area Science Festival. We uh, will partner with Maker Faire and we will go up there. Sometimes we'll offer some of those opportunities to volunteer off-site uh -huh. to do certain things for the Tech Museum. So those are good opportunities for students. And when we do programs like that, especially during the holiday season, mm -hmm. um, this past uh, November to December, we actually brought in another group of high school students to help us during the busy holiday season. So that was there's always something new and exciting that we're trying to do to bring in another group of uh, high school kids to help us. Sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. So do you have a message for the youth in our audience? Yeah, um, the, my biggest message is when, when the youth are looking for a, a job, they're hoping they're picked. You know, they drop off their resume or their application, and they're hoping and they're twitting, you know, biting at their nails, to, to hoping that the employer hires them. Mm -hmm. The one thing about volunteering is you can choose who you volunteer for, and usually that the, those causes and those reasons are near and dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the volunteers that come to the tech, they choose us not just because we're an exciting place to be, but because the, their interests line up with our interests. Mm -hmm. And our interests, the main one being inspiring the innovator in everyone. Mm -hmm. And we realize everyone is an innovator, not just kids, but also we as adults. Right. And you, the minute you stop innovating is the minute you stop dreaming, is the minute you stop uh, creating, the minute you stop in reinventing. So we want that innovation to continue to spark, not just from the high school kids, but also from those, the, many of us who are adults. Mm -hmm. So that's really the biggest message for me as the volunteer manager is, when somebody uh, decides to uh, come to the Tech Museum, we're hoping that their interests line up with ours. Mm -hmm. And it's not a matter of hoping that they'll be picked. We're just glad that they picked us. And how do they sign up to volunteer? The easiest way to apply to be a volunteer is go to www.thetech.org. Mm -hmm. Click on our About Us, and then underneath that, you'll find our volunteering page. Okay. And you'll find many different uh, volunteer opportunities. 
Um, right now, we're probably going to open up some more summer positions, which will be coming in the next few months. Mm -hmm. So when that comes around, many of our high school uh, students, they can, they're more than welcome to apply for those. But also our adult volunteer positions are readily available. Okay. And we're looking for those, whether they're um, you know, retired or semi-retired, to mm -hmm. come and help us. We're definitely looking for anyone whose interests match up with our own. Thank you, Talents, for coming today. I look forward to talking to you again next time. Thank you. As you just heard, the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose, California has a robust volunteer program. All the information is available at their website, www.thetech.org. Once again, we end our show with a message from Jessie Carr, who is a spiritual author and speaker. Each time she brings us a beautiful message of universal appeal. Today, she's going to talk about betrayal, a very difficult feeling for everyone to deal with. Welcome to Reflections with Jesse. Our topic today is betrayal. Yes, betrayal. At some time or the other, each one of us has felt betrayed by someone we loved. It causes terrible pain. Trust and betrayal are intertwined. Betrayal occurs in the closest and most trusted relationships and leaves agony in its trail. Agony that's beyond any other pain. I speak of it today because I've seen its face. The first reaction when one is betrayed is to want to lash out, to hurt back, get even by some way or means. Revenge, sadly, enters the mind. Epic plays have been written on the subject. Many movies and shows have revenge as a central theme. Alfred Hitchcock, master of suspense films, called revenge sweet but not fattening. But is it sweet? No. You can never get even. Revenge will only take you further down the spiral of cynicism. A wise man once stated that if you seek revenge, dig two graves, one for yourself. As long as you dwell on revenge, you keep your own wounds raw. Another normal response to betrayal is to debunk the entire relationship. Nothing was ever good in it. One bad action becomes the focus and all good is obliterated. Furthermore, it casts its shadow on other relationships. It leaves indelible scars. Every relationship becomes suspect, questioned, put under the microscope. They say, once bitten, twice shy. It becomes difficult to trust anyone, right? But that is hardly the way to live. Can betrayal possibly lead to something good? Can it help us grow? Could it be part of a larger plan that the omniscient creator is unfolding for us? Perhaps it is time for a new beginning. Perhaps you are now free from a bond or a relationship that has done its time. Perhaps it's time to soar into a new zone. But before this can take place, Healing has to happen. Suffering has to be transformed. Feelings of revenge put to bed. A trust and faith in a larger plan for your good has to unfold in the consciousness. The key to overcoming betrayal is forgiveness. But forgiveness is not easy. It takes time and necessitates becoming larger than you've ever been, nobler than you ever were, more empathetic and compassionate than you ever thought you could be. But it's possible. Believe me, it is possible. Forgiveness is a process and doesn't come easily. We will dwell on it in our next segment. Until then, be happy and remain in eternal optimism. Charti Kala. That was such a beautiful message. What struck me was the thought that if you seek revenge, you dig two graves. 
And the key to overcoming betrayal is forgiveness. And forgiveness is what Jesse will be talking about next time, so do join us again. And that's all we have for you today. I look forward to seeing you again after two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.